Glad right, you hear the music. You know the time. John McMullen joining the Sports Bash. Follow John if you're not already at JF McMullen. Of course, covering the Philadelphia Eagles. John, good afternoon, sir. I, I know that it's been a crazy week trying to come off that game and, and trying to put the pieces together of where this Philadelphia Eagles team is right now in the grand scheme of things. And we talk every day at this time trying to figure out from Monday, Tuesday. Now it's hump day in the middle of the week. So I guess technically we can turn the page. What do you get today that's different? Like, like where is the story advanced with the Philadelphia Eagles in the middle of this week heading into this Monday night game? From last Sunday where they beat the Giants and, you know, they get by and they're still alive. Is it who's coming back? Is it who's healthy? Is it can the offense remain somewhat sustainable like they were in the second half? Is it, you know, there's still a long ways to go with this team? Yeah, there's definitely a long way to go with this team. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, The big news today is Nigel Bradham now has a broken thumb, so... Uh, he confirmed that today and had surgery Monday, uh, had a plate inserted, six pins, uh, broke it in three places, broke it, by the way, on the third play of the game against the Giants and played the entire game uh, with that broken thumb. So Nigel deserves credit, a uh, very tough guy, obviously, uh, and plans to play with the injury. So he'll probably have a club on, on his hand. And, and by the way, Camus Grugier Hill is also playing with a broken thumb. So this this defense continues to be banged up, uh, and it's just another hit. Now, hopefully some guys can come back. I saw Sidney Jones today uh, in the hallway. He said he's going to try uh, to practice. So remember, everything is, is – is, push back a day because the game's on Monday. So This is a Tuesday. Uh, tomorrow, yeah, this is a Tuesday. Tomorrow will be the big practice day, and we'll get to see if, if Sidney Jones, Avante Maddox, Rasul Douglas are a little bit closer uh, to getting out there. Yeah, it's crazy because the health factor of the defense, there's so much weight on that. And, and listen, I would much rather have Jalen Mills out there than fill in the blank. Trust me, I'm not saying – even Rasul Douglas at this point, than not. But I wonder how much of this conversation with fans and people watching this team is, all right, if the Eagles just get healthy on defense, this this division is bad enough where they can survive and actually do something. And and part of me thinks, a lot of me thinks, John, that that negates how bad, once again, this offense and this team was to start the first half against the Giants. Yeah, they, I mean, they were bad every which way. I mean, you can blame it on the offense. You can blame it on the defense. It was as bad as it was against the Saints. I, I mean, the only difference uh, was the efficacy from the Giants' standpoint. They were not able uh, to turn going up and down the field with ease into actual points. They only had 19. They probably should have had 38 right. getting 346 yards. Uh, so uh, I, I talked about it a lot yesterday. Part of that win had to do with the fact that you're playing such a bad opponent. I think if it were the Saints again, I think the Eagles would have been run out of the building or somebody of that nature. So I, I, I don't take a lot of positives from that win. I take from that win, you had to do it to stay relevant. So it basically bought you – another seven days, eight days in this case, because the game's on Monday, uh, to stay relevant. And you got to win again Monday if you want to stay relevant again. And that's what the rest of this season is going to be. It's going to be like pulling teeth. Uh, they, they can't afford to lose any of the NFC East games. Uh, so that's Washington, that's Dallas, and that's Washington again in Week 17. And in between there, you got to figure out probably how to get a win against two really good teams. One of those two, the Rams or the Houston Texans. John McMullen joining us, Sports Bash. Mike Gill back, Aton Shander as well. So looking at the storyline that happened in the NFL, and I know the Eagles were were kind of brought into it, but how you look at it, at least for me, in a positive light as as much as it can be, I'm going to put two and two together and say the interest in Reuben Foster was connected to knowing that Nigel Bradham is banged up and also that they could use depth at that position. But 
the report comes out, and I wonder how much of a discussion this was today, John, that the Eagles, the only team that was interested in Reuben Foster to actually do some due diligence and contact the police regarding Foster's latest arrest? Well, a- any time, uh, I mean, people can say what they want, but any time that you have that kind of talent, uh, people are going to take a look and people are going to give you chance after chance after chance. And it was the Redskins, obviously, that picked them up on waivers. It was only a question of who was going to give them the second chance. I give the Eagles credit for going the extra mile, at least uh, doing the homework of, uh, of calling uh, the Tampa Police Department to see what went on. The Redskins didn't even do that. They just asked a bunch of his friends who evidently said, yeah, he's a good guy. <laughs> Let's bring him in. Uh, so I, I have no problem with them doing due diligence. Uh I don't know if it had much to do with Nigel Bradham simply because, and look, I, I think anybody knew uh, that if they picked him up at this point, he's probably not going to play. Uh, and, and the NFL put him on the commissioner's exempt list. So there was always a chance he was going to be suspended, put on that list. It, it was not like he was going to show up on Sunday and play. So I, I don't think from the Eagles' standpoint, they were like, Nigel broke his, broke his thumb. Let's go find a linebacker because he wasn't going to play either way. So they were just looking at a, at a really, really talented player uh, and doing their homework on him. Uh, so are you surprised at the reaction uh, across the board at the signing of Foster? And, and part of it is that we know, I mean, we know every day that the NFL is a privately run organization that has more hypocrisy than not in New York City in, in their front offices. And, and I don't know why people continue to look for the NFL to be a moral compass if it's curbing. Oh, I'm with you. Right, right. And, and here's the thing. like for me, Aton. I'm No, 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 no. I, I steal the <laughs> deeper. This is second-level stuff. I steal, like, the third, fourth-level stuff from you. Speaking yeah. of which, hopefully I, you can I, read I, Turkish because I need your help I, coming I, up. I, I have uh, been saying that for years. Look, if you're looking for the NFL to be your moral compass, you got to look elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I just don't understand people who who think that way. And I, hey, and I, and I say this all the time, and I said it. It's easy to go on Twitter and and say empty platitudes and, <laughs> and things like zero tolerance policy. I, I mean, it, it's rare where I defend the NFL, but I'm going to defend them here. I mean, there are legal ramifications. You just can't say, oh. Somebody's accused of domestic violence. You can't play this game. I mean, you could be sued. There's allegations that are, you don't have to look very far with Reuben Foster. The first uh, allegation was recanted. Uh, That kind of thing happens. So while it's easy, as I said, to say, oh, you you can't keep somebody like that in the league, it's not as easy from a practical standpoint where you do have lawyers and you do have agents uh, giving the player advice and saying, hey, this isn't fair. This guy hasn't gone through due process. So there's real-world implications that go far beyond, as I said, the platitudes on Twitter. So you can say zero tolerance, zero tolerance, zero tolerance. For what? Is that after due process? Is that for allegations? Because I don't think anybody – wants to be at that point in life where somebody gets accused anywhere and say, okay, you're done. That's not the right. way it works. No, you, and I think where the, I think where the NFL has gotten in trouble is they have sort of kowtowed to this mob mentality at times. And once you do that, people understand they can push you around. It's a fine line because you still have people going out and committing acts and getting in trouble and it being far more than a marijuana arrest or, you know, overpaid parking tickets or things along those lines. It's serious stuff. And I think what happens is people try to untie a a deep ball of knots with a surface string and think, okay, now, now we've gotten to the root of a problem. Like, yes, personally, I believe Colin Kaepernick should be in the league at a long time ago, but I don't know what social issue is solved by the NFL allowing Colin Kaepernick back. Doesn't mean I don't want him back in the NFL. I do. But I feel like there is so much energy spent on the NFL trying to set an example where even if they did with 
what they should be doing, curbing domestic violence more and allowing somebody like Kaepernick well, yeah, in the NFL. I, I mean, I, I, we have so many other areas in, these, in our society yeah, where it's I, like, I, now I, what? I mean, if people want to say after due process, it, there should be a zero tolerance sure. policy. If you're convicted, I have no problem with that. Uh, if they want to say Colin Kaepernick is blackballed, I will take issue with that from a legal standpoint. However, will I say there's undoubtedly that a lot of teams don't want to go through the headache uh, of signing him? Of course. Uh, I mean, my, my problem is everything isn't mutually exclusive. So everybody gets – they want to get comfortable on both sides of the fence, and everything's black and white to them. But real life is, as we know, shades of gray. Uh, and there are uh, layered issues that can't be – uh, solved with 140 or 280 characters on Twitter. And this is a perfect example of, I, I saw so many writers who I respect saying, okay, that's it. Reuben Foster can't play in the NFL. That's so easy to say. And it's also so disingenuous to not point out the contextual uh, parts of it and why the NFL can't do that. Because it's easy. It's easy to pile on because it, 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 it and it's easy to feel good to get a like on Twitter. And that's what people are shooting for. John McMullen joining us. It's the Sports Bash. Eight's on Shader. Mike Gill coming back in a couple. I, I did want to ask just something on the game, too, because you and I can talk about this for hours. And it's a fascinating conversation. At least to me, it's a fascinating conversation. So if anybody else out there disagrees, well, then, you know, to hell with them. But let me ask you about the line specifically and the heavy favorite that the Eagles are. You know, they didn't cover against the Giants and, and not to get specific into the gambling element, but just how much there is this general belief. And I don't know where it comes from, but even based on that spread, that the Eagles are a heavy favorite against Washington at home. And I, I don't see it, John. No, I, I, I don't see it either. I think a lot of it has to do with the change in quarterback, and it's just natural. People assume uh, if you lose your starting quarterback, you're in, in going to be in disarray. So I think part of it is that. Is he that and much worse? If it Smith is consistent, I, but you know, you know what you get with Smith. Yeah, I, I mean, but he is consistent, and I, and I always say there's there's worse things. Uh, than being a game manager. It's almost a dirty word. People use it. Right. Uh, but one thing, Alex Smith isn't going to make explosive plays, isn't going to uh, stretch the field and, and scare the opposing defense. But he's also not going to make the game-changing mistake on a negative side. Uh, and that certainly helps you, and always helps you in a road environment. So I think if he's out there, the line is much less than it is. But then the second part is, yeah, people still default to the Eagles or Super Bowl champions, and they're waiting for them. Uh, they're waiting for them to flip the light switch. And that part, I just, I, I don't think it's coming. When's the last uh, time? I'm sorry, John. People keep waiting for it. Yeah. When's the last time Super Bowl champion has been uttered in that locker room? Well, it, it, not I, by I'll the media. That, but, <laughs> yeah, the player. Well, the players. Uh, I, I and I give them credit. And and Malcolm Jenkins started that. Malcolm Jenkins. They had a big Super Bowl Fifty Two logo up yeah, in the locker. He wanted he, that out. He, yeah, he wanted it out, and that was before the season started. Uh, so they didn't want reminders of that. So I, I don't think you know they've never crowed about that since coming back. They understood. Uh, you can't do that if you want to repeat and you, you can't focus on the past. So I don't think that narrative has been driven by the players at all. I, I think it's just that people remember last season, and it's not just local people, national people as well, uh, and they remember how dominant this team was, and they keep expecting them uh, to all of a sudden find that same mojo. I, I don't. I just don't think it's coming. Uh, on either side of the ball, to be honest. John McMullen on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Of course, all guests here appear via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline and Sports Bash, uh, 97.3 ESPN. This season has been interesting with Zach Ertz specifically because if you look at a year that could end 
six and ten, seven and nine. You know the Eagle fan mentality. Wasted year. You didn't win the Super Bowl, even though they just come off winning a Super Bowl. But but we'll table that. The relationship with Carson Wentz and and Zach Ertz that's been established this year to maximize, I should say, this year. <clears throat> pardon me. Is is one that I don't think we're talking about moving forward enough. Which is yes, we all expect Carson Wentz to be a top ten quarterback in the NFL moving forward, but. He has that connection. He has that best friend that even if Alshon Jeffrey moves on, whatever wide receiver running back they bring in, to have that connection almost on the level in which we've seen others like, you know, Brady and Gronk, and I'm not going to go down that road. It, it, I feel like it's an under-discussed storyline, John, because of how bad this team has looked. Yeah, I mean, he's having uh, a, a, an historic year from a number standpoint, but we always talk, and Zach's a great receiver, uh, you can argue whether he's the best or the second best, but he's in the conversation. So, uh, I mean, he's that good at that particular position. But the other side of that coin is it balance is when this offense is at its best. And we talked about a lot of the balance between the passing game and the running game, but also spreading the football around in the passing game. I mean, Zach has put up, some ridiculous numbers and what he does, the Eagles generally lose uh, because, and, and it's not his fault, uh, but you're, you're sort of signaling, signaling the biggest indication that that would be the 16 target game uh, where Zach catches 14 times. Now that's unbelievable from a fantasy, fantasy football standpoint, but the Eagles lost the game. Yeah. So to me, it's better when he's catching the ball six or seven times and they're impactful in getting first downs, maybe a red zone touchdown, things of that nature, and all Sean is involved. If they can get Golden Tate involved or Nelson Aguilar or even Dallas Goddard, spreading the football around is when this team is at its best, not just keep funneling the football to Zach Ertz, even though if you do – He's going to keep catching it. John, last one for you. I'm going to give you an over-under. 18 touches. Not even carries. 18 touches. And it's not like they've thrown the ball to him, I think, four times all year. So uh, I'll say 17 carries for Josh Adams on Monday night. Over-under. I'm going under because I had 15. I think 15 Ooh, okay. is going to be sort of where it, it it's going to be. Uh, I think... You know, he he got a bunch of touches late. We talked about a lot, I think, six on that final drive. So that gets you from 16 to 22. So, I, I, you know, that's one of those things. Are the Eagles going to be up late or are they going to be down late? And that probably defines that over-under. But I, I think it's going to be comfortably at 15 for the rest of the season. I think that's where those touches are going to be, and it's going to be – sort of Corey Clement, or if we ever see Darren Sproles again, I saw him today, by the way. He was looking good uh, if he can get on the field. Uh, but they'll be the third down back, one of those two, and, and, and Josh will be the main runner. But as we've seen throughout Doug's uh, tenure, only four times as a running back hit 20 carries in his entire tenure as a head coach. So I, I don't think that's going to be consistent. At J.F. McMullen on Twitter. Always appreciate it, man. We'll talk tomorrow, same time, 4 o'clock. Hey, thanks, Aitan.